everybody and welcome to a special behind the lens. We're down here in uh, Ottawa's Byward Market because we're talking about a special camera that can't just be shown in studio and that is the very special Fuji X100. Now this camera is very much a street camera and that's why we've decided to come down here to what is arguably the heart of Ottawa to uh, show you what it's like to operate this camera and use it out in a street environment because honestly uh, we've played with it a bunch and that's really where this camera suits best. So. Uh, why don't you follow along with us and uh, we'll, we'll check out some scenery. So the first thing I talk about with this camera is really its looks because that's what's bringing all the attention to this. It's a camera that we haven't really seen anything in digital like this really ever. Uh, it's a rangefinder style camera and if you don't know what rangefinder means that means that you're looking through uh, a window on the side uh, as opposed to through the lens. Now most traditional SLRs when you're looking through the viewfinder you're looking through the lens of the camera so you're seeing exactly what the lens sees. Whereas a rangefinder, although you're not seeing exactly what the lens sees, you, you gain some advantages from it. And uh, what that is, is that you can typically see outside of the frame of your picture. And that allows you to spend more time uh, considering your composition and seeing the elements that are happening around your picture to possibly wait for the right moment in time where all of the elements of your photo are going to click. Uh, so that's really the, the interesting thing about this camera is that we are looking at a, a full-size digital SLR sensor. It's an APS-C size sensor. Uh, with a 35 millimeter equivalent f2.0 lens, but unlike DSLRs, we're not shooting the traditional way. So you're, you're looking through that viewfinder and you can see uh, through it, but it's not giving you an exact representation of the image that you're taking. So you have to get a little bit used to it, because unfortunately, it's not a perfect system. And I found that in shooting with it, the framing, although it does give you an example of what you're gonna get, is never accurate. And I don't quite understand why, because they give you this box, and you'd assume that your gonna, picture's gonna be in that box, and then often it's not quite in that box. You might have more space horizontally, vertically, and it kind of shifts image by image. Now, what's interesting about the X100's viewfinder is that it's using a hybrid electronic uh, optical system. So what that allows it to do is you're looking through a glass prism, but it's overlaying digital information. So you're seeing that framing box, and it can move around and it can resize, which makes me wonder even more why I don't get the image I see in that box. Um, but more on that later. For now, we're going to get out there and we're going to start shooting some pictures and uh, we'll talk a little bit about what's really most important with this camera, which is image quality. So let's talk about image quality because if you've read anything about the X100 on the internet, you probably know that it has some issues in actually using the camera. So if it's got all these issues using the camera, is it worth buying? Well, that really comes down to image quality. And the X100 is no slouch in this department. It has a 12 megapixel CCD sensor, but what's interesting about the sensor is that it's using their EXR technology, uh, which they've employed in their point and shoots before, but it helps to improve dynamic range and color by the way in which it handles all the light and color coming in. Now what's interesting about the X100 is that because it has a fixed lens, it has a lens that's been matched identically for the sensor. Now, what they have put in here is a 23 millimeter lens, which in APS-C size formatting is a 35 millimeter equivalent. And it's also an f2.0, so it's quite bright. But because it's designed specifically for this camera, it's also very sharp. Uh, you get very little chromatic aberration at f2.0, and the scenes are very crisp and clear uh, at any kind of infinity focus range. Now, what's interesting about this camera is that they've removed the anti-aliasing filter from the uh, sensor itself. Now this is something that's typically found in most SLRs, and what it's designed to do is help to reduce artifacting that you get in high contrast scenes. And uh, you can get interesting unwanted effects in areas that have a lot of information in lateral lines, like uh, fences or barbed wire or that kind of thing. So they've decided to remove it, and even though they've removed it, uh, it doesn't seem to be much of an issue. and it, uh, really helps to improve the overall sharpness and clarity of the photos. So all foibles aside, this thing does have quite good image quality. And I think that's really the most important thing to talk about because now I'm gonna talk about what I don't like about the camera. All right, so let's talk about some of the issues with the camera because unfortunately there's a lot of them. The first thing is that it's really slow. It's slow to turn on. It is really annoying to wake up from sleep and if you're shooting in RAW, it takes about seven and a half decades to actually save the image. Uh, and that's with a class 10 card. Uh, some people on the internet have been saying that if you use an ultra high speed card, which is a brand new format of SD card that have come out, you'll get a little bit better improvement. But I feel like in today's day and age, with 12 megapixels in RAW, 
I shouldn't have to use a $200 card in order for my camera to perform properly. And unfortunately, it is a problem. Because if you are trying to do any kind of critical work with it, uh, professionally or, or otherwise, you're gonna find that this slowdown is really not convenient. I took it out today to use on an engagement shoot and found that the focusing was slow and the image saving was slow and it really didn't allow me to use it in a professional sense. The other problem I have with this camera is that although it does take really good images, it's very hard to control exactly what you're getting with those images. You do have really nice buttons at the top of the camera that allow you to dial in your uh, exposure compensation, your uh, shutter speed, and then you can dial your aperture with a dial on the lens. These are all really nice features, but I find that you don't have a really good sense of what kind of picture you're going to take through the viewfinder when you've put in these settings. Now, we like our GH2 that we shoot video with, and it has a nice functionality where it shows you a preview of what you're going to get. So essentially, it's giving you a live, active image of what that picture is going to be when you take it. And as far as I can tell, the Fuji really doesn't do this. And if it does do it, it doesn't do it well. As I had lots of problems leaving it in automatic mode and it telling me, oh, I'm only going to go to shutter speed 1000, but we're overexposed. And I'm like, if you're at shutter speed 1000 and you're overexposed, why haven't you moved to shutter speed 4000? On top of that, the focusing is problematic. One, it works, but it's slow. Uh, secondly, if you're using it to shoot anything macro, you can't actually use the optical viewfinder to do it. Now, this is an issue that's called parallax error. Now, the reason that is is that because when you get so close to an item, this is no longer showing you anything close to what you're actually taking a picture of. So I can understand them, you know, not allowing you to use the focus to its full extent when you're using the optical viewfinder. But unfortunately, there are scenarios where the image I'm taking is very similar to the frame I'm getting and it just doesn't want to focus close enough. On top of that, if I am using a macro mode or something like that, this camera, although I put it on automatic, will not go into macro mode automatically. This is something we've had on cameras for years. I can pick up any point and shoot, I can point it at something close and it will go into macro mode. So why does my $1,200 SLR not do that? These are a couple of things that bother me. And ultimately a lot of this could be fixed with firmware upgrades. But as of yet, Fuji has not brought anything out. And ultimately I'm not someone who wants to sit around and wait for someone to correct their problems in hopes that it's going to make the camera I purchase better. I know lots of people that go, well, this isn't good, but hopefully it'll come out in a firmware update. You can't sit around and hope endlessly that your camera is going to fix the problems that it has because Fuji decides, hey, you know what? We'll do that in a firmware update. So sitting around waiting for the camera to get better, not a great idea. So if the image quality is really good, but the performance features aren't really there, who is this camera for? Well, this camera is specifically for someone who, like myself, comes out to places like this to take pictures because what this camera excels at more than anything is flying under the radar. With a camera like this, you're never really in anyone's face. People are gonna walk by, they're not necessarily gonna know you're gonna take your picture. And with a 35 mil lens, you've got a fairly wide angle image. So that allows you to shoot from your neck if you want to, or uh, you know, not have to be across the street to get a picture of someone. So because of that, this camera does a really good job at being the right kind of camera for someone who is just out and about taking pictures. I don't want to call it a performance point and shoot because it really isn't. And although it has a fixed lens and you, you know you can't change the lens on it, so it's not really an SLR, it's more than a point and shoot in both image quality and performance. And uh, what we haven't talked about is how good it is in low light. And that's really one of the nice things about a street camera is that you're going to be out taking pictures at all times of the day and you want to be able to have a camera that even when you're shooting in low light can still keep up with the pictures you want to take. And this thing takes very good images at ISO 1600, ISO 3200. And on top of that, if you are taking pictures with flash, Fuji's cameras have always been really good with flash. They do a really great job of balancing the flash so that you get lots of ambient light in, but you get a nice bit of fill flash. So this really is a camera for the street photographer, someone who's okay with one lens, but a lens that works really well. And someone's okay with image quality if it's not at the quickest speeds. Because you're gonna be able to get all kinds of pictures that people would normally get really mad at you taking because it doesn't look like a regular camera. Do I recommend the Fuji? Well, I think it's a tough choice to say. For me, I really wanted it and I really wanted to love it, but the more I shot with it, the more I realized it wasn't the camera I was expecting it to be. However, I don't think that that means it's not a good camera. I just think it means it's a camera for a person who knows exactly what they're getting into. And that would be someone who does street photography. So if that's all you do, street photography, then the X100 is a really great option. However, if you're looking for something that's gonna help 
advance your photography skills, I don't think the X100 is the right choice. I hope you enjoyed our review of the X100. Hopefully I didn't break too many hearts in my critical review of the issues this camera has. And believe me, I do love the pictures it takes. I just think that this camera could have been more than Fuji made it be.